Hello everyone, welcome to the SGIFF Youth Jury and Critic Program podcast. My name is Owen. And I'm Emma. And we today we are going to talk about the resurgence of meta fiction in films. According to the definition that I've found, it's when works of fiction try to um, show how literary and artificial they are. Something along those lines? It's basically when the film is self-aware, or is very self-aware, and you have the characters breaking the fourth wall and actually talking to the audience directly. Okay, so Emma, we have watched all the shots from the Southeast Asian short film competition, and I, I guess we have a pretty good lineup of films this year, right? Yeah, we do. Yeah, but any do you, do you, can can you name any of the films that are under I guess categorized under meta fiction? Um, I think that would be Dossier of the Dossier and Piece of Meat. Dossier of the Dossier is about a producer and a director who is trying to um get funding for their film, and then at the end of the day, they actually sort of wasted their time with a potential investor. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and then they have to pay for his coffee. The end is like they, they have some like existential crisis mm-hmm. where they're thinking like why am I even in this industry? <laughs> of course, I, I guess that the scene the scene where the producer was wasting their time was kind of like an exaggeration for comedic effect. Yeah. <laughs> but then again, I guess they they was they were trying to show how difficult it is for uh, filmmakers in general in any region and like how hard is it to get their projects made. Mm. Actually, for me, when I watched that scene, I thought it was the investor was kind of like an embodiment of their fear, mm. you know, of being rejected in a way. It's kind of like a film for filmmakers by filmmakers. Yes. Because anybody who has ever been in this industry will be able to relate, I guess, to the to the, <laughs> the protagonist, like, which is mm. the none other than the director. Yeah, so the director is actually, his name is called, uh, S- I'm very sorry if I, <laughs> if I botched this, but it's, his name is called uh, Sorayos Prapapan, yeah. He directed, produced, and wrote the script. And actually, he has a background as a sound technician. So he actually made a short film called Death of the Sound Man. He tells stories that he can relate to. Yeah. Stories that he knows from personal experience. Yeah, so... Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's quite funny. I think all of us who had, a, we had a pretty good time laughing mm. at it yeah, throughout the screening. Yeah, when I watched Dossier of the Dossier, I realised that actually... The first time I was watching it, I mean, I kind of just took it as a film that is portraying the difficulties that filmmakers face while trying to make a film. Mm-hmm. But then, like, I think on the second viewing, I was like, the film is very much about the fear that filmmakers have when making films as well. Mm. Because, I mean, from the very opening, what we see is a blank screen. Yeah. And the filmmakers are kind of deciding, like, what colour to use for the, the document, what to name the document, like, even things like what photo to use. Yeah, yeah. And then when they, they go online to look for a Wong Kai Wai picture to see how <laughs> like this famous respected dude poses. Yeah. So in a way, like pointing out all of these things that like filmmakers are guilty of. Yeah, that they actually go through all yeah, they have the experience. Right? It, yeah. It's kind of like self reflective, self aware <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I also like how the the short film is in black and white. Mm, like yeah. especially it's like it's a bit depressing, you know. <laughs> I couldn't get the meaning of the black and white because, I mean, I know some, like, independent people like to use the black and white because it's very artistic. But mm. in the case of this film, I was I was not sure what the directors and the filmmakers were going for. Yeah. Mm. I think personally, I would take it as um, a way of, like, or the way for him to say how depressing this line of work is for all the filmmakers. That's why they, they, they just look very sad like throughout <laughs> the whole time. And then yeah. at the very end when they were having a smoke at the rooftop, you, you can see like they were just thinking where, whether they should you know, switch careers. Yeah, I mean he was like looking like this the whole time like. Yeah. Like yeah. he was looking down. Like yeah. if he was standing near the ledge. Oh no! <laughs> you know? Okay, that's a bit dark but yeah. <laughs> I guess the, 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 the filmmaker behind Dossier of the Dossier, he drew inspiration from films like Adaptation. Mm-hmm. Um, no, because it's also about a writer who is trying to get he's trying to write a script uh, based on a book but he's having yeah. writer's block so he decided screw it I'm just going to write about the making of the film <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's actually quite fun oh and okay. you get to see Nicolas Cage doing some um, real acting I mean, I, he was actually pretty good in the in the film I see yeah actually speaking of like this kind of um, stories I think there's another film that is going to be screening in Singapore soon it's called Tel Aviv on Fire, and it's about a screenwriter who's mm. also struggling to write this TV series. But then, like, what he does is he gets inspiration from this border guard 
that he meets when he goes to work because oh. like um on his way to work he has to pass through a border yeah so like he gets all the inspiration for his story from this border guard oh, yeah, it's also yeah. about the process of um screenwriting and okay. filmmaking yeah and I, and I'm assuming the border guard sort of gives good advice right which yeah, surprises I him think, yeah he does and he also I think he also kind of forces the narrative into his own definition of what makes a good narrative mm. yeah that's true, that's true. Actually, wow, that's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so look forward to that, I guess. But uh, that's not screening on SGIFF, so... <laughs> Too uh, bad. <laughs> Too bad. Moving on to Piece of Meat, would you say that it is a uh, metafiction or more of a satire? Hmm... I think it's... I think when I first watched it, I felt like it was more of a satire, like a black comedy. Mm. Yeah. It's only in the second... The second and third viewing that I started to pick out elements that might make it self-aware. Mm. Yeah. It uses objects to ob- uh, represent people. Like your rich people will be like your Rolex watches. Mm-hmm. And then your the heartlanders are represented by things that are very Singaporean. Yeah. yeah. Like a Malayan or... Like, I think I saw the tiger bomb at one point. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a tiger <laughs> yeah. bomb. There's a tiger bomb. Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. And it's so self-aware, right? That there's actually a copyright um, watermark oh, yeah, on, on the like object the... itself. Yeah. yeah, I remember seeing that. I think like the those stock footage yeah, those kind stock of things. Fo- yeah, the stock, stock photos. Footage. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think everybody noticed it. It's like very yeah. subtle, but yeah. And I think on the money, there was like specimen as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like aware that like if they just put the actual notes, they might get, you know, censored by the government or something. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of um inside jokes, right? Yeah. You know, our overseas viewers, if you guys don't understand um the jokes, uh, there's a scene where our main character is a durian is trying to board the bus, but she's, you know, not able to board the bus because durians cannot go on buses. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, I, I guess it's kind of like an inside joke. It's like poking fun at Singapore's laws, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like this, I think there's also another scene um, towards the end of the film when the durian is playing football at the... Void deck. At the void deck. Yeah. And then there's a sign on the wall that says no football. And then the ball just hits the sign. Yeah. <laughs> and then bounces back. And then later we see the durian continue playing by itself. And then the ball just like deflates because like it got poked by one of the spikes. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> it's this kind of things. So anyways, um, yeah, back to meta fiction. I guess um, you know, my theory is that um, the success of Deadpool you know, in 2016 actually um, sort of made Metafiction popular again. Because mm. after all, it has been around for many years. I guess met- the first metafiction film, you know, according to Wikipedia, which is like our favorite source of information. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but anyways, according to Wikipedia, the first metafiction film was made in 1929. So it's been around for a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that um, recently it's getting more and more popular, maybe because of the success, the financial success of Deadpool. And it proves that you know, there's actually um, a demand for uh, metafiction films. Yeah. Yeah, aside from Deadpool, I think even in television, we see metafiction becoming more prevalent. Like, mm. Rick and Morty is a very good example of that. Now, I think it's a tradition for them to, um, to, to say that they're going to have like nine more seasons, ten more seasons yeah. like, in the beginning of every like, season premiere. Yeah, yeah, but you know, even at the very, even at the end of the very first episode, I remember, I think it was Morty telling Rick like they should go to the www.rickandmorty website yeah, yeah. Rick and Morty times and he just kept saying that over and over again yeah 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 yeah, yeah it's like yeah, it's like the characters are just very self-aware that they are actually in a show yeah <laughs> I guess a lot of filmmakers use metafiction for comedic effect yes yeah and I've never really seen it being used for anything that's very serious mm. per se this week there's a news of um, Nicolas Cage involved in a project he's playing himself in a movie that is about himself. Yeah. So that there's is a, like Inception on so many levels. <laughs> yeah. It's like a few le- it's like a few levels of meta right there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how they're gonna do it. Like the the director. Like will he get confused as what is going on? Yeah, like, I mean it's it's gonna be if he's using method acting, it's gonna be really hard to separate his life from the film. Yeah. <laughs> because it's like a convergence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> How's it even gonna work? I don't know. Oh my god, it's oh. like this is even worse than adap- adaptation, uh, which you know stars Nicolas Cage. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyways, I I guess you know metafiction is here to stay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's getting more and more popular. So and, and it seems to be doing very well. So yeah, 
Um, okay, well, that's the end of this podcast. Um, please support our other youth jury, uh, you know, content on YouTube as well. Yes. And uh, like and subscribe, and we will see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.